if you lived outside of the town of Wilmington, Delaware, during the 19th century, you probably found yourself, at some point during the week, sitting at the Burning Rag Inn, downing a glass of lukewarm ale. You'd be there with friends from work, shooting the breeze, maybe having a meal, with the faint smell of gunpowder in the air. They would be laughing and singing, some arguing, a fight or two, the typical stuff for an old 1800s American pub. But some days, it would be quiet, unnaturally quiet, and the gravity of that name would start to sink in, the burning rag. These were black powder workers, known as powder men, and sometimes, after a bad day at work, a burning rag would be all that was left of them. Maybe there'd be a hand or a foot to go along with that burning rag, but there would often be remnants of clothing, and because these were inevitably saturated with the chemical dust of their profession, these would usually be on fire. Over the course of their 120-year history, there were roughly 290 explosions at the DuPont black powder mills. And after each death, there would be another worker, a line of them, actually, ready to take their place. The money was good, and as far as 19th century industrialists go, the DuPonts were among the best families in the country to work for. They provided free housing for their workers and looked after the widows of all the powder men killed in their employment. So in spite of the dangers of manufacturing highly volatile chemical explosives, there was always a surplus of men willing to step into this unhealthy line of work. Dick Templeton has recently written a book on these mills and the lives of these people who kept them running. He's with us today to discuss it. If you wouldn't mind, Dick, introducing yourself to our listeners. My name is Dick Templeton. I currently live in Wilmington, Delaware. I've been working for the last almost four years as a tour guide at the Hagley Museum. The Hagley Museum is in northern Delaware, just outside Wilmington, and is the home of uh, the DuPont Company. The Hagley Museum is actually the very first DuPont factory in the United States. It was built back in the early 1800s uh, by E.I. DuPont, who was the founder of the company. And the original scope of the manufacturing was gunpowder. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this part of Delaware, most of you, I'm sure, the Hagley Museum is one of the most picturesque, prettiest local museums in the United States. The museum and its grounds are named for Hagley Park in England, and this American museum definitely has an old world feel. If you go in the spring, when the leaves and flowers are out, it has this almost storybook quality with antiquated stone buildings and bridges and a river running through the property. One of the first things I noticed about the buildings on the Hagley grounds was that some of them are three-sided, and have no roof. My first thought was that they might be ruins of some kind, but they're not. They were built that way on purpose. When E.I. DuPont, who was French, and employed Frenchmen uh, in the early 1800s, at the first part of the manufacturing process, he knew how to build these buildings and make them three-sided because that way, if there was an accidental explosion, it would channel the explosion's force in a neutral direction. And in fact, that's where the uh, name of my book comes from. Across the Creek was the euphemism that the men used for telling about their compatriots who had died in an explosion. They said, he went across the creek. These buildings are set right on the Brandywine Creek. The buildings are approximately, I would say, 30 wide and 20 deep. So the building typically had a very weak roof because, again, you wanted the explosion to go up and across the creek as opposed to back to the back of the buildings where people lived uh, two or 300 yards away. You didn't want the concussion of the explosion to 
go up and, and damage their homes or their lives. You wanted it to go to kind of a neutral place. And you had mentioned how Joe Biden just lives a mile down the road from the building. Yes. Yes. The newly inaugurated president lives uh, a mile south on Route 141 from the Hagley Mills. I know that you mentioned the man who started the business. Can you explain as much as you know about him and why they started that business there? Sure. Eleuther Irene Dupont was his full name. And thankfully for us, they called him E.I. or Irene. A lot easier to pronounce. Anyway, E.I. Dupont was a Frenchman. His father was a relatively major official in uh, the French government in the 1780s and 90s. And he and his son, E.I., were actually jailed and came within about three days of losing their heads in the French Revolution. But they were also entrepreneurs. They were printers, as well as some other jobs they had in France. And uh, they saw an opportunity in the United States to start up a business here. And so having had three or four years of apprenticeship, if you will, with uh, Antoine Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry in France, at the Esson powder mills just south of Paris, EI knew how to make gunpowder. One day in about 1800, I think it was, or 1801, he and a friend were shooting and they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of powder. They went to a local store in, uh, this was in the Bayonne, New Jersey area where they first landed when they came over in 1800. And um, the powder that he and the friend bought was uh, inferior and expensive. And so he, the light went on, he knew how to make gunpowder. So he started searching for a place to make gunpowder. E.I. DuPont found a place just outside the town of Wilmington, Delaware, and began black powder operations there in 1802. The area had a sizable French population and much of what he needed to make his product. Do you know anything about his personality? I mean, he sounds like an interesting person. He was. One of the things that evolved from the business of making gunpowder after the very first explosion, as a matter of fact, EI and his brother, who was also on the scene here, and his investors decided that they needed to do something for the families of the men who were killed in the first explosion. And so they immediately thought, well, we will provide a $100 a year annuity to the widows And also, they were able to take advantage of the home they lived in, which was basically free at the time. It was on the mill property provided by the DuPonts. And so the widows were given the capability of living in their home for the rest of their lives if they did not remarry and if they did not move away from uh, the Wilmington area. Now, some did remarry, but most of them remarried other powdermen. So they maintained whatever home capability they might have had to to stay on the property. So in comparison with other businesses at the time in America, the DuPonts were very paternalistic in that regard. They knew that providing the men with the knowledge that if they were to succumb to their injuries in an explosion, their family would be relatively well taken care of. Another benefit at the time was that the male children of the deceased powdermen were almost virtually guaranteed a job in the mills if they wanted it. And many of them took them up when their father died. When they became of age, they were then able to uh, get employment and, and have the same, same benefits. So I, I think you'd have to say that EI was a generous man a thoughtful man. One of the things that stands out about him was that after that first accident, that first fatal accident, there was never a time when there was not a DuPont on the property managing the gunpowder mills. And it was said that the DuPont families would never say, 
go in and do this, they would say, come on with me and we'll do this. So they were always involved in the business, even though they clearly knew the risks of explosion and the chance for death. You had mentioned that more than 230 people died from these explosions. Do you know about how many people were actually employed there throughout their history? Well, there were thousands of men who came and went, plus the 235, of course, who died. The DuPonts kept detailed records of their workers. And so we know that at any given time, there were from 100 to 500. I have no idea how black powder is made. Could you describe that for me, that process? Sure. It's a relatively easy process. Do not try this at home. But basically, there are three ingredients. The three ingredients are charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter, which is also known, its chemical name is potassium nitrate. At the Hagley Museum, we do have, as I mentioned, this one demonstration where we have the two eight-ton rolling wheels that were forged at uh, West Point, New York. They're made of cast iron, so as not to spark unnecessarily. Uh, You did not want sparks in a gunpowder factory. And so the three ingredients were mixed together. They were not incorporated as a chemical composition, but rather as a physical composition, very much like in making a cake, you might use salt, sugar, flour, and the the ingredients are just mixed. So these water operated eight ton wheels would roll over those three ingredients and crush them together. Do you know any of the details around any of the specific explosions, what was happening, how many people got hurt or anything like that? Sure. Again, they kept such meticulous records that they have a pretty good idea of who had died in the numbers. For example, I mentioned the 1815 explosion that killed nine men. That was the first fatal explosion. And then just three years later, the largest fatality explosion occurred in March of 1818 when 34 people died. The irony in that one is that one of the men who was killed, Michael Toner, his wife was also killed, even though women were not permitted to work in the mills. And you may recall that earlier I mentioned the concussive force of a blast. But in this particular case, Mrs. Toner heard the first of several explosions that day, and it was common even though they built the buildings, they thought far enough apart not to communicate fire or explosion from one building to the next building to the next building. There was in fact a series of buildings that went up. And uh, after she heard the first explosion, she scooped up her toddler, Eliza, and ran down to the gate, separating the living community from the manufacturing part of the property. And uh, as the women always did, they always ran down to the gate to inquire, you know, whose mill was it? Who died? Is everybody okay? Kind of thing. She ran down to the gate. And as she was running down to the gate, a condemned bit of ammunition cooked off in one of the uh, adjacent buildings exploded and sent a bullet into her path and killed her. So she was one of the two women known to have died. Another woman in 1890 was killed when the concussive force that I was talking about earlier felled her attic in on her. Uh, At the time, she was caring for her two-year-old grandson, and he also died. And so he was the only child that the DuPonts recorded as having died in an explosion. I'd also like to know, do they know exactly what sparked the explosion? I mean, clearly we know that black powder is easily combustible, but do they know at what point in the process that it caught fire? In most cases, the people who knew what had happened were killed. In a few instances, they were able to guess, just like forensic scientists today can guess often accurately, what has killed someone, they were often able to surmise or guess what had killed someone. The causes ranged from 
a piece of like a nut or a bolt falling out of the machinery and into the path of those eight ton wheels causing a spark. The wheels themselves didn't spark, but the nuts and bolts might have had the capacity to spark and, and blow up. In some instances, they thought that the men having gone home for lunch on say a winter's day when there was a fire carried an ember of the home fire in their cuff on their sleeves or their pants. And it was alive. The ember stayed alive all the way until they got back down into the factory portion. And that's what caused the explosion. Other possibilities are on a really dry day, just the lack of humidity. Any number of causes could be discerned, but they were never, rarely ever sure what had caused an explosion. Sometimes it was mechanical failure and overheating, for example. Once the men started up the water-powered wheels, they would shut them down, say, at the halfway point, at the three or four hour point if they were making ammunition, and they would put a quart or two of water in the mix just to reduce the chances of getting an explosion. But sometimes if it was nighttime and sometimes they did work 24-7, particularly during times of war, they might fall asleep and forget to go down and put water in. And so the black powder would get too dry and explode because of that. So they were never, they were hardly ever really sure about how an explosion occurred. Hometown History is brought to you by Best Fiends. Growing up, I absolutely loved watching The Goonies. Recently, I watched it again, and I realized the movie is just one of those classics that will always hold its own. Things have come a long way since we were kids. Seems like we get more instant classics each year. And you know what's an instant classic in my book? Best Fiends. It's the top-rated mobile puzzle adventure. My favorite aspect of the game is you can compete against your family and friends to beat levels. I compete against my mom and brother and my large friend group. It's been great to play over the last year with them because we haven't seen each other very much. With Best Fiends, there's always something new. Today and tomorrow and every day after that. So if you never get tired of solving puzzles, good news. With Best Fiends, the fun never ends. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. If you enjoy listening to Hometown History, then you'll be excited to hear that we have brand new content going live on the Stereo app three times a week. If you're a fan of hearing podcasts live, you'll want to take out your smartphone and join me as I discuss topics in history and other things that interest me, live from the app. You can join in live and ask questions, anything you'd like. If you've ever listened to an episode and thought, I wish they would have brought this up, then now is your chance to join the conversation. This is completely exclusive content on the live social conversation app, Stereo, and it's free. Join me and a special guest three times every week. Just pull out your smartphone and go to Stereo.com slash Hometown History to download the Stereo app and follow me by searching for at Hometown History. Again, download the Stereo app and follow me at Stereo.com slash Hometown History. The link will be in the show notes. Did they ever learn any new cautions or processes to help prevent explosions after they happened? I think they probably did. I do know this. The English manufacturers actually had a dousing system, if you will, where the individual mills would have a tank of water, say 30 or 40 gallons above the, uh, the mixing area. And these would be connected by rod going from one to the next, to the next, to the next building. And the explosion in one would cause these tanks to drop their water load and therefore make it less likely that the next one would explode because it was now mostly wet. But the DuPonts who knew about this never 
utilize that as a, a protective device. They did maintain guards at the gate and they prohibited smoking materials. They prohibited metal belt buckles. The men were either given or had to buy special shoes that didn't have metal studs in them. They had to have wooden pegs to hold them together. They would learn those kinds of things. There were other kinds of when a when a explosion occurred, they might know that there was a piece of machinery that had been worn down and caused the explosion. And so they probably paid more attention to that. They bird, B-U-R-R-E-D, the nuts and bolts to try to prevent them from falling into the mix. And that would prevent some. Of course, it was difficult to know if they were preventing anything because, again, the people who knew what had happened typically were gone. I hadn't known as much about the DuPonts, but I do have some familiarity with 19th century industrialism. And much of what I'm hearing here is a pleasant surprise. You hear some real horror stories out of the mining and railroading industries. For example, of a complete disregard for human life. In some cases, these were not just bad employers. They were guilty of some pretty extreme human rights violations. That's not at all what we're hearing from the DuPont family. For as much as the DuPonts did right, do you think there are ways in which they might have done better in terms of creating a safer environment and saving lives? Well, that's hard to say, and I'm not trying to be evasive. They were very much safety first oriented. If a rogue worker was taking too many shortcuts, they would typically do what we do today. They would talk to the individual, and then if the individual didn't change, they would get rid of them. Again, they separated the buildings as much as they could to prevent one from setting off another. They did train the men in their specific jobs. None of the workers knew the entire process unless they, you know, sort of transferred to another part of the process. So, for example, if they were in the working in the glazing mill, they might just know how the glazing mill worked and not know how the incorporation of the three ingredients worked. The family was running a business that they knew was hazardous. They did not ask their men to do anything that they would not do. Uh, one of the DuPonts, in fact, was killed an explosion in 1857, Alexis, one of E.I.'s sons, was killed, as he did regularly, mounted the roof of a burning building, and he was the end of a bucket brigade that the men had formed from the, either the mill race or the creek. They would form a bucket brigade to put out the, the flames, and uh, he was on top of one of the buildings, knowing full well that it could explode, and it in fact did. He died a day later from his injuries. But like I say, there was always a DuPont in the mills, making sure that everything was running properly and that things were going well. In that instance, uh, it took a life. They did really care about their employees, more so than what we call the authoritarian style of management. Again, not trying to downsell. For example, in the instance of these dousing tanks. I'm not sure why they never incorporated that. I think it's striking for a modern listener to hear of people working in buildings, these three-sided units that were designed for the channeling of explosions. The thought of picking up your lunch pail in the morning and going to work in a place that might explode for a blue-collar civilian job is hard to imagine. Was working in the mills more dangerous than similar industrial jobs in the 19th century? Uh, one of the things you should note is that in terms of death, over the 119 years of gunpowder manufacturing, their death toll was a much deal less than mining, railroading. For example, mm -hmm. there was a study done, I think, in the mid-1800s. Well, the study was done later, but um, your chance of death in dying in a railroad accident was one out of 156. I'm not sure what the figure was for gunpowder, but, you know, losing 235 men, women, and a child in 119 years was actually comes out to about two per year. And that was a much deal lesser figure than some of these other manufacturing 
businesses. And the men, of course, were a little fatalistic. They knew about it. Their job, if they survived, if they were in a uh, part of the factory a half mile away, let's say, and they heard an explosion, they immediately ran to the site to see what they could do to help. And typically what they ended up doing was taking buckets and baskets on the other side, the embankment on the other side of the creek and picked up the pieces. So they knew full well, but I think they were just fatalistic about it. They did have some gallows humor, if you will. For example, the whole thing about going across the creek. I don't know if you're aware, but in World War I, when somebody was killed in combat, they said he went west. And so this going across the creek was very much akin to that. They knew full well what they were in for, but they knew that their families would be well taken care of. That's all very helpful, Dick. Context is everything, right? The product had to be made, and it sounds like this was the safest way of making it at the time. You're kind of stuck with the science of your era when it comes to chemical manufacturing. After that, it's up to you to be as careful as you can, as responsible as you can with the technology you have. This is not what happened in the oil and steel industries, where there was often systemic disregard for human life. The DuPonts, at least, appear to have done better by their employees. I think uh, they were as careful as they could be. I know that as part of the Hagley Museum, one of our tours takes you to the DuPont residence. And it sits about, I don't know, 150 yards above the original mills. And so again, you know, every time there was an accident, they would lose virtually all of their windows. Plaster would fall down. EI's wife at one point was injured during an explosion. So, you know, everybody was fully aware of, of, what could happen, and, uh, you know, they did their best to prevent it. I think those facts kind of speak for themselves, at least from what I know of 19th century industrialism. For owners of major operations like this, to have that much skin in the game is pretty rare. Are you aware of any unusual cultural elements of the DuPont community? It seems like they would have lived together as a pretty tight-knit group and been somewhat set apart in their area by their being a part of this unique industry. They would have probably had their own jokes and ways of dressing and so on. Was there such a thing as a black powder culture? Uh, Yeah. I do know, for example, one of the taverns on the outskirts off the DuPont property was called the Blazing Rag. And the Blazing Rag alluded to the fact that if there was an explosion all that the survivors might find would be a bit of clothing on fire. The favorite phrase of the newspapers of the time was that he was blown to atoms. And so in many of the cases, they really didn't have anything to bury. They might have, you know, a foot or a hand. And so if they couldn't find very much, there were a couple things they did. One They would often, particularly if a body part was unidentifiable, they would bury several of those body parts in a single casket, in a single grave. In some cases, you know, they didn't even know who had died until they started reading the roll. And anybody who didn't answer who they knew was working that day was presumed to have died. Another thing that they did was if all they could find was, uh, you know, say a finger or something minuscule like that, they would have a full-size casket and they would fill it with sawdust and put the finger in the casket. And they would put the sawdust in to weight it down to make it seem like there was a full person in there. So it's it's kind of morbid and gruesome to, you know, to talk about that kind of stuff, but it was the reality of the time. They were a separate culture because they were three and a half to four miles outside the city of Wilmington. And so in the early days, everybody lived nearby because they didn't have horses. They didn't have buggies. They had to go wherever they were going on foot. And so to live on the grounds just made it that much more easy, you know, to get to work and to get home for lunch, for example. In your book, you talk about people coming in from surrounding cities to view the aftermaths of some of the larger explosions 
Could you say something about that here and how the locals might have felt about it? Because they lived on the property. They were somewhat appalled by the fact that the um, New York railroads advertised special cars to come to Wilmington for New Yorkers to come down and view the damage. It was also a case where some of the local people were able to get onto the property before the guard cordons were in place and they would steal mementos. There was one example where a farmer, one of the uh, workers lost several bushels of corn to thieves. There's another instance where somebody cut out a nice four by four inch piece of a curtain from one of the destroyed homes and, uh, they would take uh, spokes from buggy wheels or, you know, whatever they could find. And so it's a little bit of a gruesome kind of a situation. They'd come onto the property before the dead animals and the downed trees and the dead people were cleaned up. You know, the, the place was cleaned up. Most of the explosions were smaller, but even two, 300 pounds could cause several deaths. I've heard of similar things, like people cutting off the trigger fingers of dead gangsters as mementos. I think when Bonnie and Clyde were killed, they were trying to cut off his index finger and also his ear to keep them as souvenirs for some reason. It's so disturbing. I can't imagine what it would have been like to have carloads of outsiders rummaging around your loved one's remains for keepsake. It's really vile. You've talked about the way powdermen had to dress differently with no metal in their clothing, and wooden pegs to hold their shoes together. How might a mill worker look different to us at a glance? Depending on his job, he might have been covered in uh, powder dust. I know I'm not covered in powder dust when I do the demonstration of those those eight-ton wheels I was telling you about, but, you know, my pants can get a little dirty. When I do the um, steam engine, uh, it's coal-fired, and so I get a lot of coal dust on me. So they could tell from, you know, looking that that the guy was, you know, a little bit on the dirty side. You know, typically they didn't bathe every day back then. They might bathe once a week and also clean clothes once a week. So, you know, the guy would have embedded gunpowder in his clothes, you know, for a week before having the, the materials washed. When did DuPont stop making black powder? As you well know, DuPont is still around. But they stopped making gunpowder. And the reasons for that are several. One, they shipped their last gunpowder in 1921. And as you may recall, the war ended three years before. The Great War, World War I, had ended. And so the need for gunpowder went down. That was one reason. But probably the main reason they stopped making gunpowder at this particular plant, they did continue making gunpowder into the 70s, 1970s. But the reason for stopping at this particular plant, the main reason was the use of water power, which was free, you know, they didn't have to pay for it, which was nice because that would increase your profits, was going out of service, if you will. You know, we had gasoline, we had electricity, we had natural gas, we had other means of more efficiently making gunpowder than opening up a sluice gate to allow the water to roll down to the river or the creek. And on its way down, it ran water turbines or water wheels. And that's what made the machinery work. And so while it's, again, nice and free, it was not as efficient as more modern techniques might have been. So while the DuPonts continued for another 50 years making gunpowder in other locations, this whole water power thing just was sort of going out of fashion. Thanks so much for being with us today, Dick. I know I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to finishing your book, which I've started yesterday. Could you share the title with our listeners and tell them where they might find it? The name of the book is Across the Creek. The subtitle is Black Powder Explosions on the Brandywine. And that again refers to the Brandywine Creek. They can go to my website, which is Blue Rock Publishing, all one word, dot com, Blue Rock Publishing. I would actually prefer that they go to store.hagley.org because then the proceeds go to the Hagley Museum where I'm a paid part-time tour guide. 
and it helps them with their educational programs and so forth. Now it's also available on Amazon. 